So like Shannon mentioned today, we're going to be talking about why invasive species matter. So the overview for today, some questions we're going to answer is where to start with invasive species. It's a really big topic and can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I'll point out a good starting resource for you as well as going over what are invasive species to make sure we're all on the same page with that. Why do they matter? And then, of course, um, who are some of the most wanted invasive species? So where to start? Well, with a poll question, of course. So for those of you who this is your first time participating in a webinar, you can just simply click the answer right on your screen, and we will be able to see the responses. So FISP, F-I-S-P, is an acronym for what? So you can go ahead and click whichever answer you think is the correct one, and I will share the correct response with you once we get feedback from a few more people. Okay, it looks like most people have responded. Um, I'll try and broadcast the results. So you should be able to see the results now. Um, so the majority of you got it right. Kind of a little bit tricky options there, but FISP does stand for the Florida Invasive Species Partnership, which I'm going to discuss now. So when it comes to where to start with invasive species, it's a pretty easy URL, just www.floridainvasives.org. There is also a link if you look on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, it's the third link there. You can see it. Uh, Florida Invasive Species Partnership will take you right to this website. So if you click or go to that URL or click on the link in the resource box, it'll take you to a page that looks like this. Um, if you're having a hard time seeing this on the screen, you can click on, there's like four little arrows in the top menu bar. Uh, that kind of point outwards. That's full screen mode, so you can uh, use that option if you want to see the web page a little bit better. So if you go to the invasivespecies.org um, website, this is the Florida Invasive Species Partnership website. You can see FISP in the top left-hand corner. Um, and basically, um, this is a partnership of all different organizations and agencies at the federal, state, and local level that are working on invasive species management, research, education. So this is kind of a one-stop shop when it comes to resources as it relates to invasive species. So again, a really good place to start. And I would encourage you guys to explore this website. There's tons of links that you can go to. I'm going to point out one of them. Um, if you look at the top menu bar, um, there's a link for Florida, and it's C-I-S-M-A. And I will go over that next. Um, so if you click on that link, it'll bring you to a page here. And you can see it's Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas, or what we call SISMAs. So that's your second acronym for the day. So basically, the Florida Invasive Species Partnership is statewide, and then these SISMAs are a way that um, these agencies can work together on a more local and regional level. And if you're actually on the website, so this is just a screenshot, but if you're on the website, that map is actually interactive. And so you can click on you know, where you're located to find out which SISMA you belong to. There are 16 of them in the state, um, and so if you click on one, um, I clicked on the Heartland SISMA, which is where Shannon is located. And so it brings up specific information about uh, your SISMA. You can see it tells a little bit about who they are. There's links for, um, let me get my arrow out, for upcoming events, news, um, partners, and other links. And then if you look at the menu bar up here, uh, there's a distribution map. So this allows you to see the distribution of where certain invasive species have been reported. Um, you can actually report sightings, and I'll get into this a little bit more, but if you're interested in doing some citizen science, uh, you can get involved that way through your SISMA. If you just want to learn more about a particular invasive species, there's information there, um, as well as additional educational resources. So like I said, a really good place to start. Um, so just take your time to go through the website um, there. 
So again, uh, some of you might have seen this definition before if you've participated in some of our other webinars. But again, just to get us on the same page, uh, there's many definitions out there for invasive species. But the one we're going to be basing this presentation off of is uh, species that are not native to the ecosystem under consideration and whose presence causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, economy, or human health. So I've underlined kind of the two main components of what makes an invasive species an invasive species, and that is that it's not native to the area and causes harm in some way, shape, or form. So how do invasive species get here? Um, some of the main ways are ships, and that's whether that's cruise ships or through um, imports and exports. And especially in Florida, you know, we have a lot of large ports. Um, so that's a great way for species to accidentally make their way from one country to another. Um, wood products are also a main concern. So if any of you um, go camping or have been camping before, you'll often see you know, that they will not allow you to bring your own firewood in. Um, and a large part of that has to do with um, invasive species, not wanting to bring some of the smaller insects that might spread to new areas. Ornamental plants. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Brazilian pepper. So there's a lot of plants that we bring in because they're pretty, they're attractive. Um, but what we don't realize is their invasive potential. So ornamental plant in the horticulture industry um, contributes to some invasive species. Um, and the pet trade, again, this is mostly with invasive animal species, but uh, people go and buy a cute snake when it's little or a lizard um, they don't realize how much maintenance and care it takes or how big they get and then they'll release them into the wild so those are some of the main ways that invasive species uh, arrive here this is you know, uh, throughout the country but also here in Florida so why do invasive species matter well when it comes to Florida we're definitely on top. I think we're in the top five states in terms of having to deal with invasive species. And that has a lot to do with our climate as well as our geographic location. Um, you know, we've got that subtropical climate, so a lot of tropical species are able to survive here, whereas they aren't in more northern states. Um, and just in general, our location makes it us more accessible for a lot of invasive species. And then it, of course, costs us as homeowners time and money to manage and control invasive species if they're in our yard. And us could even be seen as a bigger picture um, for us as taxpayers supporting the land managers that are controlling invasive species on public lands. So over the past 200 years, there's been 50,000 non-native species established in the United States. And one in seven of those have become invasive. So it's definitely a problem um, and something we can't ignore. So they definitely matter in that way. Um, and I alluded to the cost before, but there was a, a journal article that put an estimate on the cost to fight off invasive species. And that's estimated at $120 billion with a B, per year. Um, and that's for the U United States. But that also includes costs um, for any damages or losses, so thinking like agriculture, um, as well as the cost to control the invasive species. So it definitely does not come without a price. And in extreme cases, invasive species can um, cause the function of certain ecosystems to become disrupted. So one example of that, um, if you're familiar with Salvinia minima, it's uh, basically a floating fern. It's similar to duckweed, but it's, it's larger. Um, but it can basically completely take over the surface of a wetland area and alter the flow of the water, the dissolved oxygen of the water, and really disrupt the, um, the ecosystem in that way. Um, I alluded to agriculture before, but destruction of crops is a huge concern. Uh, there's a few big cases of that in Florida. We have citrus greening, and uh, kind of more recently, you might have heard of the red bay ambrosia beetle causing laurel wilt disease. Uh, it impacts all of the species, tree species in the Lauraceae family, which includes the Florida avocado. So definitely a major concern especially for the avocado lovers. And then loss of recreational sites. So 
Torpedo grass, for example, grows in wetter areas, and it basically can create these giant mats of grass and um, can impede waterways. So people, kayakers, canoers, it can limit their access um, for recreation in that way. And in less extreme cases, uh, land values can be reduced. So if an invasive species has completely taken over an area, uh, there's obviously less value to that land. Nobody's going to want to buy that land and have to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> and the next two are kind of connected. Natural resource-based industries can suffer, um, which can in turn impact tourism. So that could tie back to the recreation component of it, um, you know, if, if fisheries are impacted in one way or another, or, you know, if the land just becomes completely unattractive, people used to come here for the aesthetics. Um, so there's lots of ways that natural resource-based uh, industries can suffer, and that, again, could also include, like, agritourism um, and ecotourism. Okay, second poll question. It's a little bit of a tricky one. So which of the following is not a part of the invasion curve? Oops, did I spell that wrong? Nope, got it right. OK, so I'll give you guys a minute. You can go ahead and click on your response there. All right, let a few more people respond. OK, so broadcast those. So a little all over the board here. It's, um, education is actually not part of the invasion curve, and I'm going to talk all about that next, although it is certainly a component all throughout the way. It's not um, a dedicated piece of the invasion curve, which again, you'll see here in a second. So this is a pretty neat tool to think about invasive species management, again, called the invasion curve. This is based on a framework out of Australia. And so um, basically, this shows that the eradication of an invasive species becomes less likely and control costs increase as invasive species spread over time. Um, and I'm going to kind of work through each section of the invasion curve and try and make sense of what this means to us as homeowners. So the first piece, I know it's a little small, hard to see, is prevention. So obviously, if we can prevent invasive species from becoming uh, an invasive species or getting here in the first place, that's going to be our most cost-effective option. Um, Obviously, there's no area infested at that point and no control costs, although there's certainly costs associated with um, efforts to prevent invasive species from getting into Florida or into the country. I don't have time to go into all the different laws and regulations, but I did include some links in the online resources tab or box, I'm sorry, in the bottom left of your screen. So if you scroll through, it's towards the bottom. Um, there's uh, two links about invasive plant laws and state laws and regulations if you are wanting to dive deeper into that. So one example as it relates to prevention is the Asian longhorn beetle. So this beetle basically bores into trees that the larvae do and can ultimately block flow of water and nutrients and kill the trees. So it's causing a lot of devastation in forests in the Northeast right now. And so our goal here in Florida is to prevent this beetle from entering, um, you know, to save our forested lands and that management costs or potential management costs. So the United States Department of Agriculture, as well as the Customs and Border Protection, um, one, one way that they're helping to accomplish this goal is to inspect imported agricultural products to make sure this beetle, um, you know, is not being brought in that way. So eradication is the next chunk here. And so the, an eradication of an invasive species is really only possible if the species is detected and acted on early. And so we often refer to this effort as a whole as early detection and rapid response. So you might have heard of that before. This is kind of your third acronym for the day. EDRR is what some of the land managers refer to. 
Um, and it's obviously more costly than prevention, but um, there's still an option and opportunity to eradicate the species at this point in time. And one way that you can get involved at this point is through um, this link here, which should be live on your screen. It's I've got one.org. And I've also included that link in the online resources. Um, but this is that citizen science comp component I alluded to before. But basically, you can create an account. And they also have a smartphone app. But it's a way that you can report invasive species that you're seeing in your area. So maybe land managers aren't aware that it's there. Um, but you're able to report it. And then they actually get verified by um, biologists or ecologists, and if it does, in fact, get verified that it's a species we weren't aware of before, then you know we can take action and hopefully um, be able to eradicate it before it becomes a problem. So going back to our acronyms, um, all of the CISMAs, so the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas in the state, were charged with coming up with a list of species that basically we should be on high alert for within our region. So for this is from the CISMA that I fall within, the Suncoast CISMA. Um, we had a whole list of plants. This is just a small um, piece of that list. And um, it goes on and on, but just to show you that efforts are being taken um, at the CISMA level. And just to emphasize, so earleaf acacia was one of the species on our list. So you can see um, you know, it's really prevalent in South Florida. It's starting in Central Florida to show up. Um, and it hasn't quite made its way to the Central West Coast, where we're located. So certainly, we are on, on high alert um, if we do see that species. And it's important to point out, too, so this is from that I've Got One website. Um, so this science is only as good as the data that we have. And so a lot of this is through people just like you um, making those reports online so that we're aware of its presence. So just wanted to point that out. So one successful example of eradication is with the giant African land snail. So this was, um, you can see in the background, it's quite a large snail. It was posing a major threat to crops down in South Florida because they were just munching away at the, the vegetation. Um, but efforts started right away to eradicate them. And it so far has proven to be a successful eradication effort. So then you move over to containment. So at this point, eradication is becoming more or less unlikely. Um, and your goal really shifts more to um, preventing the further spread of the species, hence the containment uh, title. And this is typically when all of us are becoming aware of this species. So you can see now the area that's infested is increasing control costs are going up. And so you kind of are catching on to the trend here. So an example of containment, and uh, we'll see if that part about the public becoming aware is true. So you've hopefully heard of the black and white tegu. So this was one of them. Um, an invasive species introduced via the pet trade. It's posing a major threat to our native wildlife. And um, the there's established populations in South Florida, um, I believe in Miami-Dade County, and then in Hillsborough County. And so right now, there's major management and outreach efforts to stop the spread and kind of contain um, breeding populations just in those areas. Um, so we're definitely on high alert over here in Pinellas County since there are populations right next door. And so if you know, we kind of get past prevention, eradication, containment, and we are unsuccessful in eradicating or containing the species. Um, we then reach this last component of the invasion curve, which is resource protection and long-term management. So at this point, we now say eradication is impossible, which we don't like to use that word, but it's an, an unfortunate reality we, we have to face with some invasive species. Um, and so the goal 
here becomes to manage populations to protect highly valued resources, which will vary depending on the management goals, um, you know, where the property is located, and so on and so forth. So it could be endangered species or public lands. So again, it just depends. But you can see on the curve, control costs at this point are significantly high. The area that's infested is quite large. Um, and the invasive species has now been around for some long period of time. So one example of this, uh, you might not be familiar that you are aware of the old world climbing fern, but you've certainly driven past it if you've been on any of the interstates in Florida. Um, it's often the one that just completely covers and smothers trees along the side of the road, as well as in larger um, natural areas. So it shades out the trees and plants underneath it. It can also increase the risk of fire because it basically serves as a ladder um, for the fire to climb up the tree and then um, ultimately kill the trees underneath it. And like I mentioned, at this point, this species cannot be eradicated. So our goal is really just to suppress its growth. And you can see on the map on the right, it's, it's everywhere, at least in the areas where um, it's able to survive. OK, so poll question three. Let me, I guess it helps if I open it. OK, so true or false, we all play a role in invasive species management. I wanted to end with a really hard question. OK, I don't see the number changing, so we will end it. So yes, true, good job. If anyone said false, I'd kick you out of the webinar. No. So yeah, we all certainly play a role in invasive species management. Um, and that can take many different um, shapes and forms in how that happens. But it's important to remember, for those of us on this webinar, you know, looking at just our yard. So what you do in your yard can ultimately have an impact you know, elsewhere in a nearby natural area. Um, I think I've said this before, but, you know, I'll often have people say, you know, oh, I have this certain species, which I know is invasive. They're, they know it's invasive, and they're like, oh, but it's only in my yard. You know, I make sure I watch it. Um, and we do have control over that, but what we don't have control over are the species that visit our yard, so the birds, the raccoons, the squirrels, that can then you know, eat the fruit of a particular plant and bring it outside to another area and help, <clears throat> excuse me, spread the invasive species that way. So really, um, it's important to take care of invasive species in your own yard. So you might be wondering, you know, what's the incentive for me? Um, I think a big incentive is to know that you're not contributing to the problem. Like I just mentioned before, you know, you don't want to be that guy or that girl that um, contributed to the spread of an invasive species that's wreaking havoc um, on a, a public land somewhere. Um, and know, you know, if you are controlling invasive species in your yard, that you're ultimately helping our native species, whether that's plants or animals. Um, and if you remove invasive species, um, and replace with natives. So if you remove invasive species, plant or animal, that's a plus. But if you're removing plants and you replace, um, or removing invasive plants and replacing them with native plants, um, ultimately you'll spend less time and money over the long term. And it's really important. Um, in removing invasive plants from your yard is certainly a plus, but they, they tend to grow back pretty quickly if you don't um, plant something in their place. So that's just something to remember if you're thinking about taking some action in your own yard. OK, so now I'm going to go over some of the most wanted. This is simply based on questions that Shannon and I get, uh, or invasive species that we get a lot of questions about. Um, so this isn't based on any scientific paper or anything like that, but just wanted to highlight some of the ones that we hear about a lot. Uh, Brazilian pepper tree, certainly I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, and I already mentioned it was originally brought over as an ornamental. Uh, you know, the pretty berries come out during Christmas time. 
But the good news is we have plenty of natives that also have pretty red berries that you could um, plant in its place. And I included a link in the online resources box for um, there's alternative to invasive plants commonly found in north, south, and central Florida landscapes. So there's a publication for each different region of the state uh, if you want to find out what good um, alternative species you can plant in place of invasive species in your yard. Air potato, certainly something, um, a vine that probably many of you are familiar with as well. There is a biological control now, the air potato beetle, that you can actually get shipped right to your home. So uh, I've tried to include links for most of these species in the online resources if you want to find out more. But uh, So there is an option to use biological control if you have air potato in your yard. Cane toad, uh, this is the very, very large toad that secretes a toxin um, that can make your pet sick and can possibly even cause death in your pets. So definitely something you want to be cautious and aware of in your yard. Uh, and same with the Cuban tree frog. So um, an invasive tree frog can grow to be quite large. Same with the toad. They both get larger than any of our native species. And if you have those in your yard, I've included links, which include ways that you can um, humanely remove them from your yard. Malaleuca, this is one species that was kind of a big hot topic back in the day. Um, there was a lot of efforts to eradicate, and then it kind of fell off everyone's radar. And Shannon and I are starting to kind of see it creep back up. So it's got that really white, papery bark, uh, pretty easy to identify. Lantana camara, so this is another one. A lot of people have this in their yard. It's got really pretty flowers. Unfortunately, it is an invasive species, and um, there are plenty of good options for um, native or just simply uh, exotic species that are not invasive that you could plant in its place. This is definitely one, if you remove it, you want to plant something in its place, or it will be a long-term battle. Coral ardesia, this is kind of a new one. Uh, I would say more on the EDRR list for the early detection rapid response. So certainly, um, if you have this in your yard, please, please remove it and consider uh, planting something in its place. Balsam apple, this is another pretty new one. Uh, I looked on the I've Got One map, and it's not really been reported too many places yet, but it has a very distinct leaf shape and fruit, which you can see in the picture there. Uh, it's a vine, so you can just simply hand pull that uh, vine and dispose of it that way. Carrot wood is a tree species. Uh, it's I, When I looked on the map, it seems to pretty much be isolated to coastal areas throughout the state. But uh, a large tree, it's pretty easy to identify, but definitely one you want to take care of. There's uh, some alternative species you can plant in its place. And then I mentioned torpedo grass before. This is, again, going to be found often in wetter areas, can completely take over. You can see here it's just growing in these giant mats. So uh, definitely want to try and remove this if you have it in your yard. So what can you do? Uh, I already kind of just went over, but definitely remove invasive species from your yard. Replace with natives if, you, if it's plants. Educate yourself on invasive species, so you're doing that today. So great job, but especially plant species. There's still some plant species that are classified as invasives that are still sold in stores, so it's important to educate yourself. Uh, you can become a citizen scientist, like I mentioned before, on the I've Got One uh, .org website. And then, of course, help Shannon and I by sharing what you learned today with others. And with that, I will uh, take any questions. And certainly, if any of you need to run, uh, we would really appreciate if you wouldn't mind clicking on the link on your screen for um, a short eval. But otherwise, I will see what questions there were, Shannon. All right, Lara. We didn't have too many asked while you were speaking. I'm hoping a few more will come in. Um, the first question we had was from Barbara. And she asked, is the climbing fern 
like kudzu that is invading many other states? Uh, I mean, I would say it's similar in its growing tendencies, but in terms of appearance, they're quite different, so I'm not sure which angle she was really asking. But yeah, they can certainly basically grow and smother out. Um, and I know, Shannon, you mentioned kudzu is becoming an issue in your area, so I don't know if you have anything to add. But um. I would just say that, like Lara said, in growing habit and the effect it can have in an ecosystem, it is similar. But um, as far as identification is concerned, they're quite different, like Lara said. Um, and they're both able to grow quite prolifically in Central Florida. We are starting to see kudzu more here in Polk County and Central Florida in general. So the other question we had um, asked about if you could show some better pictures. Uh, that was from the Countryside Library, and I did see that you included some of those in your presentation. I have a couple links that I'm going to add to the chat box in a minute that includes better pictures of the climbing fern. Uh, we have two different varieties, Japanese and Old World, so I'll include those links. The next question for you, Lara, is what can we do about the invasive species we see being sold in stores? Yeah, that's a question we often get asked. Um, unfortunately, it's just it's a long process. Often um, the regulatory agencies are aware of the species, but it's a matter of um, documenting the impact that the species have before they can show the science that it should be um, basically not allowed for sale. Um, but certainly you can write to um, your state representatives about it. Uh, you know, the, we have a voice as members of the public, and so you can certainly use it that way. Um, and I don't know, Shannon, if you know of any other good outlets or avenues um, for that. Just what you said, so asking our elected officials to perhaps consider additional species as recommended by area biologists or to streamline the process to get something listed. Um, we've had some local volunteers who will go to stores and ask specifically for a particular species to not be sold in that store because it's an issue locally for that area. Um, I've not heard of much success from that method, but simply letting your stores know that you don't appreciate them selling species that are a proven issue in the area might be something that you could do. So another question we had for you, Lara, is ginger an invasive species? Well, that's a tough question. There's many species of ginger. Um, and so I guess it would depend on which species of ginger it is. Um, a good resource that I actually am now realizing I don't think I included in the online resources is the FWEPSI list. So I can pull that in real quick and just see what ginger species, if any, are listed on there. Um, I don't know if you know of any off the top of your head, Shannon, but I know there's several different species of ginger. That's not one that I've run into frequently, so I don't have any additional information for it. Let me see. Yeah, I just did a quick search on the current list um, of Flepsy plants, and I, it, no ginger popped up, so should be should be in the clear. OK. Uh, the next question is, is from Catherine, and she asks, Mexican petunia and lantana are being sold in box stores. Um, that's kind of a statement and a question, so maybe I'll just go for it, Lara. Uh, the answer to that is yes. There are some horticultural varieties of Mexican petunia, which is Ruella and Lantana, that are being sold in box stores. Those species have been genetically designed to be sterile or to be non-invasive, or they're simply a horticultural variety that has been shown to not be invasive. However, they can still become weedy in your yard. Um, and if you either purchased a property or if you have it showing up in your yard and you did not plant it, there's a good chance it is the species or the variety that is not sterile or has not been sold as non-invasive. Anything to add to that, Lara? I think you pretty much nailed that one. 
Okay, so the next question is from Barbara. Have they found a way to contain the fern and the kudzu? Um, not to my knowledge. So that would be fall in that ca kind of last category of the invasion curve, um, where it's just uh, resource management, long-term management, and resource protection. Um, I'm not aware of any efforts to contain at this point. I would agree with that. There are methods to treat an area or to kill the plant as it's there, but it is as it's a fern, it does have spores which can um, survive a lot of harsh conditions. And so the best thing you can do is if you're starting to see it creep into your property is treat it early and treat it aggressively and prevent it from moving up that curve on your own small property, um, but wide scale, Lara's correct. They've not found a, a, a silver bullet, as it were. All right, the next question is from Sharon. Australian Pine has overtaken a piece of property her employer is thinking of purchasing. Uh, where can she get resources to destroy it? So the university has um, really good resources through um, what we call EDIS publications, um, and I can send you a specific link for Australian Pine, but if you just uh, do an online search and include EDIS, um, Australian Pine Control, there should be a, a document there, um, but I can certainly uh, send you or in the follow-up email a link specifically for um, Australian Pine. But it's typically um, basically a cut stump, so you'd have to pay somebody to come in and cut the tree and apply herbicide is, is the most common way for trees. It might be a little bit different for Australian pine. Excellent. Another resource for that is the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants website, um, which you can get to by going to plants.ifis.ufl.edu, and you can search for species there. I will find that link and post that as well with Lara. So the next question is more general. It's from Catherine. It says, how do I identify invasive species? Um, I'm sorry, how to identify brown anoles? Oh, and this is in your wheelhouse, Lara. Yeah, this could be a whole webinar for me. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll at least address the brown anole question because otherwise I wouldn't know where to begin with invasive species in general. But um, brown anoles from the green anoles, the main ways are um, brown anoles have a more rounded snout compared to the native green anoles. Um, the brown anoles also can never be green. They are coming kind of different shades of brown from really light brown to really dark brown. Um, but the native green anoles can go from green to brown. Also, the green anoles have a white chin that does not change colors. So if you see a white chin, it's our, our native anole. Um, and also patterns. If you see any patterns on the back, it's um, going to be a brown anole. There's some lighter patterning sometimes on green anoles. But if there's distinct patterns like diamonds or anything like that, it's definitely a brown anole. Um, and I guess the last way is the dewlap, so that little piece that they stick out um, when they're feeling threatened. On the brown anole is a bright red with kind of a yellow outline, and the green anole is um, kind of a lighter pink color. Oh, sorry, are brown anoles invasive? Huh. Long story for that one question. So answer is yes, but it again would fall in that last category of um, it's been here for so long, it's so well established that there's no eradication efforts. Um, basically, our biologists and everyone say, you know, at this point, you'd probably be causing more harm than good because they've basically become a part of the ecosystem. So, yeah. Yes, they are invasive, but there's not really a whole lot that we can do. <laughs> I mean, you can. I can have a whole story uh, on if you want to try and control them in your yard, but um, it's kind of a, a, a losing battle, unfortunately. And Catherine, if you're interested in doing that, please feel free to email 
Lara or myself, um, we can give you our contact information. Actually, you should have it from your webinar registration. So just feel free to reply to any of those webinar emails you got and we can get you more information on that if you're interested. For everyone else, the time is now one o'clock and we're going to end the webinar here. If you have additional questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and if we can answer them, uh, we will do that for you. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. Please don't forget to click on the link for the evaluation survey on your screen now. It says click here and we appreciate any feedback you might have for us. Please register and join us for a future webinar if you're interested in the topics of endangered wildlife, creatures of the night, or backyard bird habitat. And we look forward to seeing and hearing from you in the future. And have a great Wildlife Wednesday, everyone. Thank you.